Thank you all for coming out today, and especially uh, thanks to Professor Hickman for all his work in arranging this talk. Um, obviously, I've been asked today to speak about my second book, uh, The Regulation of Research with Human Subjects, and I'll get to the details, of course, but for those of you unfamiliar, uh, the basic story here is that over the last half century, governments, uh, led by the United States, but also in other countries, have sought to protect people who participate in medical, psychological, or social research by imposing systems of oversight on researchers. And so this is a story of how people uh, claim authority over scientific knowledge, and also how people claim authority over the people who claim authority over scientific knowledge, and possibly who has authority over the people who claim authority over the people who claim authority over knowledge. Um, and, and so we sort of you know, go on forever. Um, and what this means, ultimately, I think, is that this is a story of power. Because the power to ask, asking questions is power. And regulating what questions can be asked is a form of power. And I think we all have to be skeptical of power. Um, the IRB system, as I will explain, grew out of a skepticism of the power of experts. And that can be a good thing. But it has ironically created its own system of power. And I think that uh, people need to question that power just as much. Um, and particularly, I want to look at the ways that power and expertise are interrelated. Um, I want to suggest that knowledge can be a dangerous thing, but that ignorance can be a pretty dangerous thing as well. And that gave me the title of the talk, uh, Ignorance is Strength, a uh, reference, of course, uh, to George Orwell's work, 1984. Um, I think it would help to start with a concrete story. And the story I want to tell is of this fellow, Scott Atron, um, an anthropologist at the University of Michigan. And I think whatever you think of Scott Atron, uh, there's no question that he's an interesting fellow. He's got uh, research interests going from Middle East ethnography to the natural history of lowland Maya, and then religion. And particularly interesting for our story today, um, he's become interested in terrorism particularly the question of why people become terrorists. And to answer this question, why people become terrorists, he wanted to ask terrorists, why do you become a terrorist? Um, and uh, once you start asking questions of people, uh, suddenly you are in the realm of the Institutional Review Board, or IRB, which um, is uh, a, an institution at universities around the country um, set up to uh, control the, the kinds of research that people do with other living beings. Now, um, what Adrian wanted to do particularly is he wanted to talk to people who had attempted to be suicide bombers um, and who had failed and had been jailed as a result. Uh, for some reason, he could not talk to successful suicide bombers. Um, so this was his, his second choice. And the problem that the IRB had was that these folks were in prison, in many cases in Indonesian military prisons, and they weren't sure that these people were freely choosing to talk to Atron. So they proposed a bunch of restrictions about lawyers being present and so forth, things that were simply inapplicable to Indonesian military prisons. And Atron was unable to do the work he wanted there. He also wanted to talk to people who had not tried suicide bombing but were members of uh, what he considered, or what others considered, terrorist groups. And again, the IRB told him, no, uh, you might uh, be infringing on their rights. If you do report them, you can't talk about specific organizations, such as Hamas. You can't talk too much about these individuals' backgrounds. And Atron uh, came to conclude that there were so many restrictions put on his research that he could not do what he considered vitally important research in helping us all understand how people become terrorists. Now, what interests me to this story is who was it who was in charge of putting these restrictions on Atron and regulating his work? And the chair of the IRB at the University of Michigan was this man, James Sayer, um, who was a psychologist. But I think it's pretty important to understand what kind of a psychologist Sayer is. Sayer is a, a psychologist um, of uh, vehicles, basically, how people drive, and what kinds of windshield wipers are useful to them, and what kinds of windshields help them see the, the street better. He knows pretty much nothing about terrorism or Indonesian military prisoners, prisons or any of the other kinds of things that Adrian was working on. Now, to his credit, uh, Sayer has both 
admitted this in print, that he has struggled to uh, review this kind of work, and he does seem to have put in a good faith effort to find experts to advise him on how to um, advise Atrium. But uh, this is still a very strange system that we have, where in order for Atrium, one of the world's experts on terrorism, to uh, be able to conduct his research, he first has to get permission from a board uh, that is led by someone whose research interests, however important to automobile safety, are very far removed from the question at hand. So what I want to do today is ask about this system where non-experts are put basically in charge of experts. Um, first of all, I want to look at the historical origins of this. How did the IRB systems designers come up with this kind of odd system? Secondly, what are some of the consequences? What kinds of friction are imposed when experts have to get permission from non-experts? And third, what kinds of reforms might be available at the national and local level to ease this friction? So I'll start with the history of the IRB system. Um, obviously, uh, if you want to know this in detail, I have a book to sell you. Um, but here I'll go through a few key points, uh, particularly relating to this question of expertise. Now, the system emerged actually from a system that values expertise greatly, and that is the system of peer review. Um, you're all in the university, you probably have some idea of what peer review is, but peer review um, really took off in the post-war period at a time when all kinds of research was being valued as never before. There was an explosion of scientific research after World War II, nuclear weapons, spacecraft, uh, the polio vaccines, and also controversial social science projects, such as Alfred Kinsey's reports on human sexual behavior. Uh, the federal government greatly expanded its funding, and as you can see, federal researchers made the cover of Time magazine. Um, and so this was a really exciting time, but with all that expansion came some problems. And as an effort to rein in some of the research that was being done with questionable ethics, uh, in 1966, the Public Health Service, uh, that is the Surgeon General, puts out this public policy um, 129, which is, is the first IRB policy from which all others are descended. And what it, the key words here is that there's going to be prior review. Before you go out and do your research, you have to get permission. But the permission will, be, will come from your institutional associates. Okay, so if you're at a lab, you basically got to get other people at the lab to say it's okay. So think of the alternatives here. The Public Health Service did not say, we're going to do a study group, NIH study group peer review, which is what they did for funding then and now. Um, they're not going to say, everyone send your proposals to a national board that will say yes or no. They didn't want to have things that centralized, nor did they want to pick a bunch of people off the street the way a jury system works, for example. No, they said, we want expert, but we want local experts. And they thought this was a good compromise between being too central and being uh, too reliant on non-experts. This system uh, collapsed within a few years, uh, most notably uh, in the early 1970s. And a lot of things were going on in the early 1970s to challenge the question of the authority of these kinds of experts. Um, most significantly for our story, in 1972, Americans learned of the project widely known as the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, which for 40 years um, had um, public health service researchers had observed syphilis in a few hundred African American men uh, without treating them. Uh, the initial coverage exaggerated some of the details, but the truth was shocking enough, and it made people wonder if scientists were really morally capable of policing themselves. Uh, at the same time, there are all kinds of other challenges to authority. You have Vietnam, of course. You have Watergate. Um, and then you have uh, university experts recommending that people go out and watch Deep Throat. Um, so this kinds of thing uh, made people really question authority and the authority of scientists in particular. And let me give you a statement that I think really exemplifies uh, this kind of questioning authority from the uh, chair of the uh, Berkeley IRB back in 1973, and this is Bernard Diamond, uh, who says, uh, whether it's a Nobel Prize winner or a graduate student, uh, we will not let you be the sole judge of ethical issues in the use of human subjects. You must submit your report to a review committee that is an IRB, and we will say whether it's right or not. 
Um, and uh, the key words here, though, is even as, as Diamond was insisting that Nobel Prize winners did not have the authority to judge the ethical validity of their own projects, he was also promising them that the IRB would be somehow specially qualified to review their research. Um, and, and this is a tension, an ambivalence about authority that I think lives with us today. Um, so let me go through uh, how this tension evolved over the next few decades. Um, Robert Levine of Yale is really one of the architects of the present system. And uh, he, he was the IRB chair there. And uh, what he's saying uh, about the IRB regulations that emerged of the 1970s is to claim that IRBs are not simply branch offices of the federal government. Uh, it was called uh, Office of Protection from Research Risks, or OPRR, back in the 70s. Uh, now it's called the Office of Human Research Protections. But he's claiming that IRBs are not uh, regulatory uh, bodies of the federal government. And uh, I think this is not really true. Um, in fact, if you look at today's IRB regulations, uh, IRBs have a whole lot of things that they have to do to meet federal standards, including registering with uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and following all those rules. Um, so to me, this is very much acting as a branch office of the federal government, even as the claim of local authority uh, persists. So there is one ambiguity there. Another ambiguity is uh, in the Belmont Report, which is uh, a document that you may know that all IRBs uh, pretty much subscribe to. And the Belmont Report itself, uh, I think, reveals this tension. It says that the idea for reviewing the justifiability of research is accumulation and assessment of information about all aspects of research. Think about how much work that implies. Okay, a case like Scott Atron, right, who wants to interview failed suicide bombers. That's a lot of work for a whole committee to assess all the relevant information that could go into that decision. So the development report says, well, that'd be really nice. At the same time, it says, but you don't really have to do that. That's the ideal. How close do you have to get to the ideal? We don't know. Okay, another ambiguity showed up in draft regulations that were proposed in 1979 as a result of the same commission that wrote the Belmont Report. The 1979 draft regulations um, said that one of the things that an IRB would have to do, and it's number one here, is determine that the research methods are appropriate to the objectives of the research and the field of study. Okay, so the IRB was going to be tasked with deciding whether every research project had a correct method statement. And researchers went crazy about this. They protested this vociferously. They said, an ethics committee has no business telling me that my science is good or bad. That, you know, peer review for a grant, that's fine. But it's not the job of an ethics committee to tell me I'm doing the ethics wrong, or the methods wrong. And in fact, as a result of that protest, that provision was stricken, and it does not appear in regulations today. However, IRBs are required to consider the importance of the knowledge that may be reasonably expected to result from a study when they are weighing the risks and benefits, which is part of their regulatory responsibility. So the question here is, are IRBs supposed to evaluate the science or not? Well, yes and no. Another ambivalence in the regulations. And then one that um, really uh, <coughs> remains today is the question of whether scientists or non-scientists are supposed to be doing review. In 1974, Congress set up the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, the National Commission for short. And it was an 11-member commission of whom a majority were not human subjects researchers. Okay, six non-researchers, five researchers on that commission. Now, in practice, the scientists, I think, had a louder voice. But Congress itself was putting scientists in a minority role. And that continues uh, not in, in that extreme, but in the regulations today. So when you are composing an IRB, you are not allowed to have only expert researchers. Um, what the regulations do is, is they, this is, this is I, I think, a, a good illustration of the tension. Um, on the one hand, in green, what I've highlighted is a bunch of provisions in the IRB membership clauses that I think privilege 
the man in the street view, if we may. So you have to have members who reflect racial, cultural, and community attitudes. You have to have people who are primarily concerned with the welfare of subjects, that is not with the product of the science. You can't have all men or all women. You can't have members of one profession. So if you want an all anthropologist IRB to review anthropology, it's not allowed. Um, you have to have non-scientists, for example, lawyers, ethicists, members of the clergy, and you have to have someone who is not affiliated with the university. All of those are saying, if you leave scientists to their own devices, they're going to get it wrong. Let's bring in a lot of other voices to oversee the scientists. At the same time, the same regulation promises that the IRB will have experience, expertise, that it will have professional competence, professional conduct, and will be knowledgeable in all areas that it reviews. Well, there, you're privileging expertise. At the same time, you're privileging the non-expertise. And I think this, again, is a reflection of that ambivalence and a source of attention we have today. And particularly, it tries to meld this in this uh, operative clause here. The IRB is supposed to promote respect for its advice. Um, I think this is very hard for IRBs. If, if the person who, who is your audience believes in expertise, the presence of all those green clauses is going to diminish their respect for your board. If the person who is your audience is skeptical of expertise, then I think all the red clauses are going to diminish respect for your board. So the IRBs are put in a very difficult position right here in the regulations. So my point here is that really from, not from the very beginning in the 1960s, though to some degree, but particularly since the early 1970s, we have this ambivalent, ambivalence about expert authority, and that ambivalence remains in the regulations today and affects the work that IRBs do and creates a fair amount of friction. So let me move toward um, how the IRB system operates today and how it reflects that friction. Um, there's not a lot of research and guidance from the federal government. Um, so IRBs have a, a fair amount of discretion. Um, some of them use it wisely and some of them do not. Uh, a major grievance of researchers is that boards lack the expertise necessary to do the work of weighing benefits and risks. Um, and again, I, I just don't think this is surprising structurally. Um, if you think of all of the work that is done in a modern university, all the kinds of research from windshields to terrorism and all the rest, how is any group of half a dozen or a dozen people supposed to know what goes on? Um, and so as a result, a lot of people who have looked at IRBs find that um, they do not uh, do everything the regulations ask for them. So Maureen Fitzgerald, who has looked at IRBs and ethics committees in, in several countries, um, finds that they are susceptible to what she calls folk devils and moral panics, worst case scenarios where people on the IRB start imagining everything that can go wrong and uh, sort of lose track of the likelihood that that will happen. Um, a very common example of this concerns consent forms. Um, researchers submit these, IRBs read them carefully, changing the word here, uh, changing a phrase there, even though everyone knows that no consent form is particularly good. And you can sort of test this by giving the same consent form to multiple IRBs, and they will all make changes, and they will all make different changes. So one IRB says it all has to be in the present tense, another one says it will all have to be in the past tense, for example. And uh, empirical studies have this, of this um, show that IRB uh, review tends to make the forms longer, more complex, and can also add errors as well. And uh, the journal Nature, for example, calls this uh, board games, um, particularly arguing that uh, these forms are a problem. Another very common problem with IRBs that you see over and over again is the belief that talking to people who have suffered trauma will somehow make the trauma worse. And you can find many examples of on the blog. Now, this is an empirical question. And the best evidence we now have is that interviewing people who've had trauma is not harmful or re-traumatizing. And if anything, it is more likely to help people to talk through what happened to them than hurt them. Um, so IRBs you know, may just not be aware of this um, empirical evidence. They may also have trouble finding the empirical evidence. Internet research is a good example. Um, so uh, internet researchers have done some studies on this. They asked IRBs, what do you know? 
Um, a few of them, a few IRBs are familiar with the guidelines for ethical research put out by internet researchers, and then particularly, they didn't even know how to find that. They didn't know who to ask. We rely on the IT department to advise us. So uh, an IRB looking for an expert finds the guy who can fix your hard drive rather than someone who has done an online survey. Um, and uh, so then there have been efforts to train the IRBs to do it better. The problem here is that it's almost an impossible task. These are very busy people. Um, they don't have time to be educated in everything that's coming before them. And some of the efforts have really failed. So UCLA, for example, uh, tried to devote, ask the IRBs to show up at each meeting five to 15 minutes early uh, so that they could learn about the latest empirical research, and they found that uh, the faculty members would show up after the training was over because they did not value it. Um, and so this leads to lots and lots and lots of complaints, many of them looking like this, where someone who's expert in particular field, sexuality research in this case, says, I'm getting these restrictions put on me by anonymous individuals who may not have the same subject matter expertise. We get this a lot with uh, qualitative versus quantitative researchers. Uh, this is somewhat older from 1995, but a qualitative researcher who uh, tried to, came before a hospital IRB in this case, and they started screaming at him that he uh, didn't have numbers in his paper, and therefore it was not valid science. Um, and you can get lots of examples of people who have some methodology that has been going on for decades, snowball samples or whatever, that you know, is sort of the core of their discipline. And suddenly the IRB is telling them that it's invalid. And in many cases, um, the researchers are, are frustrated that there's no one on the board who understands their work. Now, some IRBs get around this by appointing one member who is expert in a particular area. What happens then from what I've heard from these members, is that member then becomes solely responsible. So Raina Laterman at Princeton, for example, uh, for a long time was the only anthropologist on the Princeton IRB, and she was basically solely responsible for reviewing all of the anthropology projects and people, the rest of the board, would vote however she voted. Well, that might work, but it is a, a perversion of the system as it exists on paper. These are supposed to be uh, consensus decisions. Um, so I think, uh, <coughs> That, that's of dubious validity. Um, in other cases, IRB simply judge projects in a way that I consider pretty arbitrary. So in her book, uh, Laura Stark has uh, described viewing three IRBs at work. She actually sat in on their meetings, and one of the most consistent things they did was to reject proposals that had a lot of typographical errors in the belief that one's typography and spelling were an indication of one's ethical character. Um, and, well, look, this has been defended. You can, you can find comments on this. I, I think that not only is this arbitrary, but it's actually discriminatory because a researcher whose who's la second language is English is going to make more spelling errors than someone whose first language is, is English, um, even though they may have equal moral character. So I think IRBs are reviewing what they can rather than reviewing what they should in some cases. And this isn't just bad for researchers, of course. This is also bad for people, for participants in research, who at some level are counting on the IRB to protect them. And you can read work by Carl Elliott, for example, on cases where IRBs um, really, I think, let uh, research participants down. So IRBs can be uh, overestimating the risk in many cases while underestimating the risk in other cases uh, because they don't have good tools to evaluate the um, risk properly. And again, I, I think that um, a lot of this is, is systematic. Um, and it depends not on the individual people at universities, uh, but rather how the whole system works. Uh, so one problem, for example, is there's been a shift away from more expert research to less expert research. Uh, this is a claim fairly research, recent uh, by uh, James Oakes. I don't know why I didn't put the citation up there. But um, he's claiming, and you'll see this in many cases, well, IRBs are, are just made up of peers. Um, so why would they have any reason to restrict the research of people who are in the same boat as, as they? Well, what I see is actually a shift away from faculty governance in this issue towards staff power. And particularly, uh, this shows up in uh, the work of a group called Primer um, and the establishment of something called the Certified IRB Professional. I think the very 
existence of something called the certified IRB professional is a major shift away from the premises of the IRB system as designed in the 1970s. Remember, the early system, you'd have expert researchers talking to community members. And nowhere in there is there a role for someone in between who is a professional ethics person, right? So this kind of shows up in the 1990s that there's going to be someone who is not the amateur off the street, nor the dedicated researcher, but someone whose main expertise is knowing the regulations and applying them. Now, some people do this job very well. It is, of course, important for universities to be compliant with uh, federal regulations. Um, others do it fairly badly. And the problem is that there's not a lot of accountability in their work. So let me give you a, a, what I consider a, a pretty gross example of this. Um, in 2011, the IRB office, not the IRB itself, but the staff office at Indiana University was telling researchers that um, they would not, the IRB would not approve research on Facebook and MySpace on the grounds that both sites explicitly state that their site is not for research but for social networking only. Now that is a factual claim, is it not? Well, it's a factual claim that is easily tested. I went over the Facebook page and uh, this is what Facebook says. If you collect information from users, you have to obtain their consent and tell them that it's you and not Facebook that's doing it. And you also have to tell them how you're going to use your stuff. So there, Facebook does have rules about doing research, but those rules are not the rules that Indiana University claimed, which Indiana University claimed that there was a ban on research. So in some cases, IRBs and their offices are simply providing bad information. And then this information spreads. So I found the same claim on the University of Massachusetts Boston website. <coughs> Identical wording, right? In the case of Facebook and MySpace, explicitly state all the rest. Now, I don't know which came first, uh, the Indiana version of this or the UMass version, because neither of them cited each other. So all I can tell you is that one university employs a fabricator, the other employs a plagiarist, and they're both working in research ethics offices. <laughs> You can find comparably false claims about provisions of Facebook, provisions about federal regulations all over the place. I have many examples on my blog. Um, but, uh, and, and you can find similar examples of sloppiness by scholars, of course. Uh, what's different about it when an IRB makes a mistake like this is that it is constricting someone else's intellectual freedom to do the research they want to do. If I make an error in one of my articles, you don't read the article, you write that review. When a university ethics office makes an error like this, it really clamps down on what other people can do. I've not been impressed by the uh, systems that a lot of IRB offices use to find and exchange knowledge. Um, when I first got interested in this, I uh, joined the IRB forum, uh, which is now run by Primer, and it's a, a place where uh, IRB officers can get together and sort of discuss proposals, and I was pretty appalled, quite frankly, by the low quality of the discourse there. Someone will say, what do you think about this proposal? And a bunch of other people at other universities will say, well, here's how we do it, without any citation to empirical research, to regulation, well, maybe to regulations in the Belmont Report, but not to any of the scholarship that I read. Um, another example of what I consider a pretty low-grade information source is the infamous CITI program, uh, which stands for Collaborative Institute Training Initiative. You probably have it here it's at thousands of universities around the country, and many universities require every researcher to complete this online training system before they will be allowed to do research with human subjects. The problem with this is that a lot of the information here is incomplete or even wrong. So this was uh, a paragraph here that I read interest. This was sort of early in my research. A close reading of the regulations will find mention of research methods in the social and behavioral sciences and humanities, including surveys, interviews, focus groups, oral history, etc. Well, a close reading of the regulations will show no such thing. This is simply false. There is a document that goes along with the regulations in 1998, um, but those are not the regulations. And the author of this, whose training I believe is in nursing, uh, simply made a mistake. And yet this is the required training from my university and many universities um, around the country. 
And many conscientious researchers who care a great deal about research ethics are driven crazy by having to complete this training. Um, this is a psychologist um, out of the University of Oregon who objects to the way that uh, people like Milgram and Zimbardo, uh, whose work is controversial, to be sure, have been compared to Nazis uh, and the Tuskegee scientists by this training. Um, another uh, researcher also at Oregon uh, compares it to being force-fed a high-fat, low-nutrition meal at McEthics, right? It's cheap, it's easy, you know what you're gonna get, but it's not good for you. And uh, Ronald Bayer, who's actually a uh, professor of, at, at the Center for History of Ethics and Public Health at Columbia, okay, who's one of the leading scholars of research ethics, um, has this to say. I listen to people talk about taking these online tests, and they talk about it the way Russian social scientists used to talk about having to learn the right Marxist doxology at the old Soviet Union. And just to, uh, in, in case anyone missed the point, he called the city program mortifyingly stupid. Now, City claims that its customers are satisfied, but independent surveys at the University of Connecticut and the University of Michigan suggest that at least a third of researchers regard this training as a waste of time. Now, again, I am critical of IRBs and of some human protection staff, but I do not blame them for the bulk of today's problems. I see federal regulators as having put them in impossible situations. For example, the reason the City program exists is that the federal government spits out all these requirements without providing better resources for meeting those requirements or even sensible guidance on how to understand them. And instead, uh, for decades, the federal government has been discussing the problems of IRBs without doing anything serious to address them. Um, and in fact, I, I would say the federal government has produced uh, a lot of pseudo-expertise. There have been a lot of commissions over the last years. Um, so starting with the National Commission in 1974, we had the President's Commission, replaced by the National Bioethics Commission, Advisory Commission, the NERPAC, the President's Council, now uh, the President's Commission on the Study of Bioethical Issues. Um, we have a lot of books coming out. Um, in particularly in 2002, there's this uh, work by Institute of Medicine that had a companion volume uh, specifically about social and behavioral sciences. And you might think that uh, there was, in fact, a sustained federal effort to continuously improve the system. But I would argue that that's largely an illusion. What you get in many cases is admissions that we don't know very much. So this is, again, this 2002 book. Uh, we were trying to do quality improvement here, but we were stymied by the lack of empirical data um, and the scant formal knowledge about how protection programs can be improved. And that companion report on the behavioral and social sciences said pretty much the same thing. There's little available systematic information. Data are scant. OK, so we've had this system in place depending on how you date it, from 1966, 1971, 1974. Uh, I can give you various dates, but we've had this system in place for decades. And we know, as a nation, very little about how it's working and how it could be made better. Moreover, even if these various commissions did have more knowledge, they have very little power to change the regulations. So, as Lennon said, what is to be done? Um, in the long run, I think we need a better regulatory regime in this country. And I think we need one that is grounded in the scientific principle of trial and error, learning from experience. Um, in case this sounds utopian, there is one in Canada. Um, what Canada did was they came out with their first tri-council policy statement in 1988. Now, tri-council right there, what does that mean? They've got three different groups. The Health Council, which is vaguely analogous to our NIH, uh, a, a Natural Sciences and Engineering Council, kind of like the NSF, I guess, and then a Social Sciences and Humanities Council, kind of like the NIH, the National Endowment for Humanities, if the National Endowment for the Humanities had any money. Um, and they gave them equal weight in framing the, uh, their ethics regulations. Now, the 1998 report wasn't very good. They, they based a lot of things on what I consider flawed United States models. They got a lot of complaints. But then here's what happened. They revised their regulations. They're not technically regulations. They're guidance 
in response to concerns and complaints and experience. <coughs> so they do uh, multiple revisions of that, first revi of that first edition, and then they come out with an entirely new second edition uh, in 2010. And the 2010 edition, again, nothing perfect here, but a lot better than the 1998 edition or anything we have in the United States. So in particular, the 2010 edition has uh, an entirely new chapter, chapter 10, specifically on qualitative research. Again, this is one of the main complaints about IRBs in the United States is that if you're doing ethnography, if you're doing oral history, if you're doing folklore, if you're doing community-based research, all kinds of qualitative research, you've got someone in the back of the IRB saying, well, this isn't statistically valid. Right? What is the hypothesis that you're testing? <coughs> and, you know, if you added up the hours that IRBs and researchers spend arguing about when you need a hypothesis and when you don't, um, you could save a lot of time in this country. Well, Canada recognized this, and they specifically wrote an entire chapter saying you've got to have different ways of measuring the validity of qualitative research. Um, and when this came out in 2010, I thought, wow, that's great, but it's going to be a warm day in Winnipeg before we get anything like that down here. The American regulations are so entrenched, how are they ever going to change? Then, and this was real surprising to me, in summer of 2011, the Department of Health and Human Services issues an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking, or ANPRM. And what they basically said for the first time in about 30 years is our regulations aren't working too well. Uh, specifically, they've got burden, delay, and ambiguity, ambiguity for investigators, indeed. And we have to reduce it, indeed. So this was very exciting. Um, and, uh, you know, first time in 30 years that the U.S. federal government has really said we might need to think about changing these regulations. Um, and the chief person behind the reform is Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel, uh, Rahm Emanuel's brother, for those who care about these Washington things, um, who was at NIH at the time, now at the University of Pennsylvania, and one of the key claims he made in explaining why we needed this policy is that uh, IRBs lacked uh, sufficient expertise. As he put it, a single IRB often reviews research on a wide variety of scientific topics and research settings, some of which are not aligned with the scientific expertise of the board members. Uh, or to put it a little more bluntly, right now all we have on risk is your gut reaction and my gut reaction, which is worthless in my opinion. So a lot of this proposed reform is designed to replace those worthless gut, gut reactions with more empirical and expert evidence. And you know, just the fact that this report, the proposed regulations, came with pages and pages of footnotes, I think right there is an example of the, the mindset behind it, the idea that they're going to read everything that's been written on IRBs, including stuff that I wrote. Um, you know, that's, you know it's authoritative, right? They read my book. Um, uh, but uh, this is, uh, what I want to suggest is this is a different philosophical approach to the problem than you will find in the city program or on IRB forum or on the IRBs that were observed by Laura Stark and Maureen Fitzgerald. Now there are some worrisome aspects. Uh, these are still primarily health re researchers like Dr. Emanuel who are writing these and a lot of their proposals for extending uh, rules from the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act or HIPAA to other kinds of research are very bad ideas and some of their specific proposals about value banking are very bad ideas and we can go into the details later um, at the Q&A. Um, so I don't want to suggest that this is great and um, uh, and if you want more details, I mean this is a screenshot I did um, a few months after, there actually there were uh, more than 1,100 responses to this. Uh, what, what they do is they publish in the Federal Register and they say, anyone in the, in the world, uh, give us your feedback. And they got 1,100 responses, um, some of them very wise, some of them uh, not so much. But um, one of the interesting ones, since I was uh, invited here by the anthropologists, I should say that the American Anthropological Association submitted what I think is one of the very best responses and what it basically says in three words, leave us alone. Um, the, uh, 
the American Anthropological Association has got a long history with ROBs, but in, in their response to this proposed notice, what they said is uh, the regulations should cover human experimentation and biomedical procedures and not try to cover ethnography. Um, so it's really interesting to see how, at the official level, um, the AAA is uh, pretty fed up with the system as it now operates. Now, I don't know if the proposed advance notice of proposed rulemaking will lead to an actual new rule. Um, some people think the process is dead. Some people think it's still alive. I live near Washington, but I'm not tied in enough to give you any inside dope on that. Um, so don't hold your breath too long. Um, in the meantime, I think there are things that, um, I do want to say, however, that, that if the regulatory throttle were opened up a bit, there would be ways that we could um, enact reform that would not completely abolish any kind of oversight. Uh, one example, for example, is uh, the McAllister system. So McAllister College, it's a teaching college not a research university. Most of the research there is by students, and most of it uh, is not really covered by federal regulations. So that means they can do things with the IRBs that don't meet federal standards. And in particular, they've done departmental committees, where the geography department here, for example, has a three-member ethics committee to oversee undergraduate research. Um, so it's more of that original idea of institutional associates, people who know the, that kind of research very well, no community members, no windshield psychologists, just some human geographers reviewing research in human geography. That might be opened up if there were some deregulation. A bolder proposal uh, was fleshed out here in, oh gosh, I think this was science, yeah, um, by Robert Klitzman of Columbia, which is to have more retrospective review. A lot of what IRBs do by its nature is guesswork. They bring in a proposal, they say, here's what we think might happen. And what they don't have is a responsibility to see what did happen to previous proposals. So if you think about other forms of research misconduct, plagiarism, falsification, fabrication, all of those are policed retrospectively. We trust the researcher to do the right thing, and then if you're found out that you did the wrong thing, you're booted out, right? So Klitzman and others have proposed moving to more of that retrospective review. To come back to the American Anthropological Association, what they think we need is a national commission specifically of social scientists, and even there, they're very careful to be representatives. We want humanistic social researchers, we want legal scholars, historians, uh, sociologists, um, to sit down and talk together, uh, not about drug trials, not about medical devices, but specifically about the problems of research in social sciences and humanities. Now, this seems like a pretty obvious step to me, but again, we're close to half a century into this process, and this has never happened in this country. So, um, this would open up some space as well. Um, you know, my question is, this idea of a commission of social scientists to make rules for social science. Is that common sense, or is that a radical reform? Unfortunately, I think it's both. I think common sense would be a radical reform compared to what we've had over the past decades. So again, I think we have a national problem uh, that has been imposed on us by federal regulators. Um, that said, I think there are few things that local IRBs and IRB offices and universities could do under the current regulatory regime to make things a little better and to bring in more of that expertise that I think has been crowded out. So one idea is to embrace faculty governance. Um, the principle of faculty governance is under attack in all kinds of ways. Uh, you can find all kinds of books about the corporate university and the rise of the administrators and all the rest. But uh, we still, at least at many universities, have some idea that the faculty know best about things like tenure, about curricula, and I think research ethics could be there as well. And uh, this is unfortunately not the case at most universities. At most universities, the IRB is essentially a creature of the administration, uh, typically a vice president for research who is responsible to the federal government, will appoint the members, appoint the staff, and let them set their own rules. What a few universities, such as uh, Ohio State, UCLA, University of Cincinnati, University of Michigan, University of Texas at Austin, okay, these are leading research universities. What some of them have done is they've set up policy committees, not to review individual cases, but to provide guidance on things like how should we deal with undergraduate research? How should we deal with qualitative research? Should we have an appeals process? 
okay, that really um, allow faculty to have some input on how the IRB will be run within the scope of federal regulations. Um, are these perfect? I don't know. We're spinning up one at George Mason University. I've been appointed to it. I will let you know how it turns out. But if nothing else, I, I think it's a promising sign of respect that the faculty are being asked to contribute in this way. Another step that we could get to more ethics, evidence-based ethics is to share ethics applications. Right now, you write an ethics application, you send it to an IRB, it's never heard from again. This means that people around the world are proposing similar projects on internet research, on sexuality research, whatever, and the IRBs are reviewing them in their own silos without any kind of international conversation the way we would have in, in journals or other forms of scholarship. Now, uh, Martin Tolich at the University of Otago in um, New Zealand has set up what he calls the Ethics Application Repository, abbreviated TEAR. I don't know if that's tear like you're crying or tear if you're ripping things up. He's from New Zealand, so he says it's tat or something like that. But anyway, um, and this just um, launched, I think, in the fall. Uh, but you can go on there. Some people are sharing their applications. And I think this idea, and this is what we do from methodologies all the time, right? If you're going out to do a scientific project, you, you read someone else's bibliography, you read their methods section, and you emulate it and adapt it to your own work. Why don't we do this with ethics applications? A third step that you can do is provide alternatives to the city program. OK, there's no reason that you have to have every researcher go through the city program. That's not a federal requirement. Um, it's not even a requirement to have any training. But certainly, you can provide alternative training. So Macquarie University in Australia, for example, set up uh, something, an online training system, specifically about, well, they say social science and, and humanities. Really, it's about ethnography, and really, it's about anthropological ethnography. But the principle is there, that instead of reading about um, medical experiments or medical studies like syphilis in, uh, in Alabama, uh, researchers are, are, are asked to read about current ethical debates in their field, like the human terrain system um, in the Army and um, things like that. So uh, at Princeton, they've got another system like this. But uh, the point is, uh, the city program, I think, really antagonizes a lot of researchers who care deeply about ethics, giving them the opportunity to do more relevant training um, can provide a lot of help. And then finally, uh, perhaps most importantly, is just to uh, base IRB decisions on empirical research. Uh, this idea is not new. This is, you know, 15 years ago, a federal working group uh, said, just don't make up risks. You need to figure out what risks are realistic and base your restrictions on there. In 2006, uh, some people uh, created the Journal of Empirical Research on Human Research Ethics. So every you know, four times a year, I think they publish, you get lots of information about what kinds of projects have proven problematic and what kinds of projects uh, have not proven problematic. I think it would be great if every IRB member read this journal and uh, knew the relevant work. And uh, most recently, there's this great article that came out about a year ago, uh, a framework for evidence-based re research ethics review. So uh, doctors have been working through what they call evidence-based practice uh, for 20 years now. This is a proposal to adopt what basically is a five-step process of asking what are the questions, how would we research those, but all of it comes back to not basing IRB decisions on gut reactions, but saying to the researcher, hey, have you read this article? Because here's what happened when that other person did Facebook research. Or the researcher saying, the IRB, here's what happened when this other researcher did Facebook research. It wasn't a problem. Can I do the same thing? Um, footnotes, right? We all love footnotes. I love footnotes. Um, why can't footnotes be part of an IRB system? Unfortunately, they haven't been. And the authors of this article conclude that the culture of IRB review and decision making must change simply to align it with that scientific method that um, we all use in other parts of the university. So these are various ideas for reform. What I want to suggest is that they all have one thing in common, which is to swing the pendulum back a little bit towards expertise rather than that jury model of bringing in people off the street and having them use their gut reactions. Uh, oversight is a good thing. I'm not suggesting that we let researchers uh, alone to do whatever they want without any oversight. But oversight can also 
become problematic and get in a, a rut and even be abused. So I think it's not enough to question authority. I think we also have to question those who question authority. Thank you.